All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Panos Russos from uh, Mount Sinai, New York. Uh, so I'm gonna be chairing the, the session called Using Psych and Code Related Data for QTL-like Analysis and Integration with Genetic Risk Variation. Um, these talks uh, are part of the PGC WWL uh, set of series of uh, webinars. And I'm really glad here to introducing our speakers uh, that I believe they have really fascinating stuff to show you today. Uh, so before we go, just to show, uh, put a little bit of background and just bring everything uh, we have been doing as part of the second code to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, so as you know very well, PTC has made tremendous progress in increasing the catalog of genetic risk variant associated across multiple uh, neuropsychiatric traits. Uh, this creates a huge opportunity to map those genetic variants to disease mechanisms that will actually help us develop new treatments as, and at the same time be able to enhance the concept of precision medicine. Um, so to also supplement some of those efforts, Psych and Code was established in 2015 by NIMH to be able to bring together multiple institutes, investigators, and human brain tissue and omics data resources. And that was the goal to be able to better capture disease processes that they affect the human brain um, either coming from controls or coming from disease uh, specimens. Now, the first phase of the second code papers um, that end up in the, it was back in 2018, and the result was uh, a dozen of papers that they primarily describe how genetic risk variation for common and complex traits affect cell type specific regulatory elements. Um, in addition, besides the knowledge that we gained back then, uh, Second Code was able to create lots of resources, primarily from different data and different omics coming from the human brain, that they have been subsequently utilized in multiple different downstream analyses with a goal to help us uh, characterize uh, the GWAS risk variation. We're now very excited because we are exactly now at the stage preparing the second phase of the Second Code manuscript that the goal is to expand the previous efforts in some of the critical following areas, including population scale analysis that now include transcriptomics in the human fetal brain tissue, population scale analysis by looking at adult brains, but now targeting not only transcriptome, but also the epigenome, novel assays for single cell and spatial omics that we can now apply in the human brain, as well as innovative methods that we can actually perform high throughput functional validation. So you will hear more about it today from our amazing speakers. And I also have placed here some of the preprints that you can actually uh, scan and find on MedArchive or BioArchive. And you can also read more about those specific studies. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce our speakers today, uh, who again, I would like to thank so much for the participation. Um, so our first speaker that I would like to introduce is Dr. Mike Andal. He's a head snacker, associate professor of psychiatry at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so just one quick housekeeping thing. Um, I suggest that we go and we have all the talks back to back. If you have questions, you can actually put them and uh, post them on the chat. And then at the end, we're gonna have some time to also have a Q and A session. And then you can also ask more specific questions. So with that, uh, Mike, thank you so much for joining. So uh, please uh, take it away. Thank you, Panos, uh, for the kind introduction, and thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to present our work today. Um, I will be discussing our um, our recently pre-printed but unpublished work developing a, uh, and generating a large-scale atlas of gene and splicing regulation uh, in the developing human brain. And I will also note that we are hiring, so if any of this is of interest to you, please uh, reach out to me. So we have a preprint uh, here that is currently pending on MedArchive. So I don't, unfortunately, don't have a, a fancy QR code to share with you, but hopefully in the next day or two, it will become live. Um, as you can see, this is a very large scale collaborative effort to pull together this uh, cross ancestry atlas that I'm going to be describing today. Um, and this has really been spearheaded with my collaborator, Chun Yu Liu, uh, as well as been really driven by three very talented graduate students um, in my lab and in Chun Yu's lab, Cindy Wen, Michael Margolis, and, and Ruji Adai. And so this really uh, largely represents the, the hard work that, that uh, these individuals, as well as all of the, the collaborative team, uh, has put together to, to, to get this data set together. So 
Um, and I, so I think I don't need to introduce to you why it's a challenge to gain insights from GWAS into the actual biological mechanisms. Um, as every day there's a new larger scale GWAS that comes out identifying um, more and more loci associated with complex traits like neuropsychiatric disorders, but then actually the critical bottleneck uh, is taking these identified loci and gaining insight into the specific biology that, that this is telling us. And so here I show you the top genome-wide significant locus in autism from the Grovedal paper in 2019. And as you can see, it's very challenging based on this pattern of linkage disequilibrium and the associated variants in this locus to identify both what the causal variants are, uh, as well as what the causal sort of target gene is. Um, and even if we know them, uh, understanding the, the effect or the mechanism through which the variant impacts the gene also is, is, is still uh, a large challenge. And as Panos nicely introduced, um, this was one of the major reasons uh, that the Psych ENCODE consortium itself was in initiated, was to begin to provide large-scale functional genomic annotations for the, uh, uh, the human brain through which to interpret non-coding genetic variation that was being uh, increasingly associated uh, through GWAS with complex traits. And so I, I won't spend any time um, uh, describing this. This is published work from the first phase of the Psych ENCODE consortium, um, which profiled uh, over a thousand postmortem human brains and has since been extended by, by many other papers, um, generating very large scale comprehensive regulatory analysis of, of human brain. Um, and so if we take these, uh, these uh, annotations and overlay them on top of our, our GWAS uh, locus here. This is these are the two EQTLs for the genes that are closest to the the top index variant in autism. We can still see that there is no uh, interpretable mechanism here that that we can identify that is um, that is uh, underlying this autism association. There's no actual EQTL for this XRN2 gene, and I think you can hopefully appreciate that this other gene uh, here, this does not co-localize. This has a different pattern of, of association. And so this really, I think, highlights some of the challenges uh, with gaining mechanistic insight. Um, and so this is one example in autism, but we can actually a look at other disorders like in schizophrenia, which has many more GUS loci for prioritization. And this was a very nice paper from Panos's group last year um, that built a, a large scale mega meta QTL atlas uh, of the adult brain and used that to co localize uh, of the 284 GUS loci with schizophrenia. And at the end of the day, less than 25% of these loci have some kind of co localized signal. That we can that gives us insight into the the mechanism um, underlying that that locus level association, and so this has led many in the field to question, you know, where are these disease associated QTLs? Where instead of missing heritability, it's now really missing mechanism. We have all these loci, but we don't really know what they're doing um, uh, in 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 mechanistic detail. And there's really been three major explanations or, or three uh, predominant explanations that have been given. Um, first is with the development and rapid innovation in single cell sequencing technologies. Some have argued that perhaps uh, we need better cell type specificity or we need to use single cell uh, sequencing to identify single cell QTLs and maybe that will identify the missing mechanisms. Um, there's also questions about the developmental timing. We know gene regulation is a dynamic process, and so perhaps we're looking at the wrong timing. Um, and then there's also questions of what is the appropriate molecular readout, whether it's gene expression or splicing or some measure of, of the epigenome like chromatin accessibility. And so today my talk will focus on uh, integrating and building an atlas that, that pulls together several of these uh, key features, both focusing on the timing and the developing human neocortex, as well as looking at both gene expression, splicing, and isoform regulation as our molecular readout. And although we don't have single cell resolution exactly, we um, use some uh, deconvolution techniques to gain some insights into cell, uh, cell type specificity, which I'll show you at the end, which does in increase and improve our resolution to detect mechanistic effects. So, um, at the 10,000 foot view, what we have done is performed a large scale mega analysis of, uh, um, of five different studies um, that have profiled the developing human neocortex. And so this now, um, and we have uh, compiled and uniformly processed SNP genotype and RNA sequencing data from 672 unique samples. 
uh, from um, the developing human neocortex again. Um, and this is largely spanning the first and second trimesters of gestation. Um, between largely between four and say 22 weeks, although we do have samples uh, across all three trimesters. Um, and importantly, this is also a cross-population atlas. Um, we have a, a large representation not only of individuals of European ancestry, but also from admixed African and uh, um, uh, American um, ancestries, as well as from both, both sexes. And just to give you some context as to what's happening in the human brain during these developmental time points. Well, um, during the first and second trimesters, we're really seeing the neurogenesis happening, um, as well as these newborn neurons are differentiating and migrating uh, radially up and becoming a deep and upper layer excitatory neuron populations. This is also the beginnings of astrogliogenesis and synaptogenesis, although those typically peak uh, at a little bit later time points. But these are obviously critical, critical um, process, biological processes that may be relevant to many of the disorders that we all study. So when we pull together uh, this large-scale reference panel, this large-scale functional genomic annotation panel, obviously we ha now have greater power to detect QTL mapping. Um, and uh, that's shown here in terms of the number of genes we're detecting that have a significant cis eQTL. In this case, more than 10,000, what we call e-genes at a permutation level or stricter uh, significance cutoff. And you know we're, we're getting close uh, to where psych encode was with roughly double the number of samples. And, and so this, I think, you know, highlights that um, we're not all the way there, but we're definitely filling in a lot of critical aspects of, of gene regulation with, with this panel. Um, and also we can leverage the, fat, the, the allelic diversity across the multiple distinct ancestral populations um, and perform cross-population fine mapping, which for identify, identified QTLs allows us to um, uh, Find, we find that there's a, a much smaller credible set size um, uh, around what the quote unquote causal variant or causal QTL is. And, and this allows us greater precision in terms of identifying the true uh, variants that, that have an allelic effect. Uh, finally, uh, ne next we can also uh, contrasted several different molecular readouts, not only uh, eQTLs, which is typically done, but also isoform, imputed isoform expression QTLs and splicing QTLs. Um, and this provides about 5,000 more genes that show uh, transcriptome-wide uh, significant QTLs and, and really can add to the power to detect um, mechanisms. Given that we have uh, developmental samples and that we have samples from both trimesters, we were also interested in contrasting trimester specific or temporal uh, regulation of, of gene expression, uh, temporal dynamics of gene regulation, and uh, remarkably find that there's many more e genes present in the first trimester than in the second trimester, even though our sample sizes are completely matched. Um, and this is uh, not being driven by expression levels that are different between two genes, uh, just showing with one example. Um, and we can actually make a sliding window and we can uh, quantify heritability as uh, across our samples as um, post-conception age, uh, across the post-conception age. And we see this really striking drop in, in cis uh, gene expression heritability, um, which, which was uh, very surprising to us, but, um, but quite interesting. So taking this atlas, we can now try to uh, uh, hone in on what what and where and how uh, neuropsychiatric GWAS uh, traits may be mediated in the developing human brain. Um, we're using a method developed by Sasha Gusev's lab called MESC, or Mediated Heritability Analysis, where we can take all of our eQTLs, isoQTLs, or splice QTLs and say, to what degree do these annotations mediate the underlying heritability of the given neuropsychiatric GWAS uh, through summary statistics? And what we find is that isoform QTLs really substantially capture um, more, uh, mediate more heritability than gene expression or splicing, uh, local splicing QTLs alone, although still um, the, the overall magnitude of mediation is, is low. Um, and this was really mirrored also through our LD score uh, partition heritability enrichment analyses shown here for ISO QTLs. Uh, we can begin to look at temporal regulation, again, through the same mediated heritability and comparing first and second trimester gene expression or isoform or splicing regulation. And again, uh, here we see that really it's the second trimester that, that seems to mediate a greater degree of heritability for multiple traits than the, the first trimester, and, and particularly for these isoform quantifications. 
So this is the big picture view of of what's of where and when and maybe how these um, these uh, GWAS uh, mechanisms may be acting. But what about individual loci? And so I return to this example, this really nice example from from uh, Panos's lab, um, and we can perform now the same colocalization analysis using our fetal brain uh, atlas, and um, we can now uh, identify significant colocalizations at more than sixty percent of GWAS loci. So this is up from twenty five percent previously with adult brains in much larger panels. Uh, really, kind of uh, I think highlighting the importance of the developmental context here. Um, many of these were, were for schizophrenia, given that it has the largest number of, of GWAS loci. Um, and we can recover variants and gene uh, effects that were previously been validated experimentally, like for furin, uh, as well as new kind of potentially interesting targets like GABA receptors, um, GABA-A receptors. We notice in many cases that there are situations where a single variant co-localizes with QTLs from many genes in a locus, and we think this may be tagging something like a structural variant or a, or a haplotype with a structural variant. And so we can't resolve in these cases what the sort of specific, um, which gene may be quote unquote mediating the trait effect, but we can um, use techniques from Mendelian randomization, in this case developed by Mike Love's lab and, and um, with Nana Matoba, our collaborator, um, to begin to look at how allelic heterogeneity may provide additional support for individual genes uh, in, in the locus. We can, uh, we can also begin to rec uh, recover mechanisms for known rare variant risk genes. So in this case, SP4 is a gene that was identified from schema as a rare variant schizophrenia gene um, and has a GWAS loci, although the mechanism of that GWAS associated signal was unknown because there's no QTL for SP4, um, at least in the fetal brain that we could detect. However, what we do find is that there's a very significant splicing QTL in SP4 that's a cryptic splicing event. So there's a new exon here between exons four and five that's not annotated anywhere um, that gets spliced in with the risk allele and leads to nonsense mediated decay through inclusion of a premature stop codon. Um, this happens a very small percentage of transcripts, but leads to sort of an essentially a downregulation effect, but through, through a splicing mechanism um, that was previously uh, Un, un, uh, annotated. Um, and finally, we can begin to add cell type specificity, in this case through leveraging network analysis. We've shown that through unsupervised clustering and network analysis, we can computationally deconvolve uh, gene expression effects within uh, specific cell type populations and find that many of our modules that we identify in this context really have um, uh, cell type hub um, marker genes as the hubs. And so if we look at um, our modules and uh, we, so we built a, a set of co-expression modules and, and look at how um, the interaction between QTLs and the levels of the module eigengene, in this case representing what we think of as a cell type or cell type specific gene expression patterns. And when we do this, we can identify uh, dozens of co-expression modules that have significant um, QT, uh, interaction QTLs. Um, that and these modules are are known to be in, we are enriched for cell type specific gene expression markers from from fetal single cell RNA seq, uh, and we validated uh, through a collaboration with Jason Stein and um, and a PhD student in his lab that these um, replicate with a, a cultured neuron and progenitor cell QTL line, um, sort of providing some orthogonal uh, experimental replication uh, of of this uh, cell type specificity. Um, and just highlighting one example, this is a module um, that is enriched for deep layer excitatory neuron markers uh, that we find has a significant interaction QTL with schizophrenia. In this case, it's a gene BRIN P2 um, that has an interaction QTL that appears to be acting or in the context of, of deep layer excitatory neurons. Um, and this gene is uh, known to function in the retinoic acid signaling pathway that is very important for developing the cortical patterning and, and has been linked uh, to schizophrenia uh, previously. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, hopefully I've conveyed that we have this large scale, uh, developed this large scale gene regulatory atlas. Um, here you can uh, access our um, our summary statistics on, on the Synapse portal and we will very shortly have our preprints um, available. Um, and are currently working to also inter integrate these into an interaction interactive visualization portal for the, the community to use. 
Um, and with that, I'd just like to thank again all of the individuals who um, really contributed to this. It's been a, a large scale collaborative effort um, uh, co-led by, by Chen Yu Liu um, and, uh, and thank you for your attention. Mike, thank you so much. This is fascinating. Um, so we're, we're gonna we're gonna leave questions for the end. So if you have questions, just a reminder, you can put stuff on the chat. And we're gonna now go to our second speaker, Dr. Gabriel Hoffman from Mount Sinai. He's actually gonna be presenting chromatin accessibility QTL from human brain tissue and validation of fine mapping variants using MPRA in IPS derived neurons. Gabriel, please take it away. Thank you. Can you? hear me and see the slides? Yes. All right. Thank you. I'm going to talk about uh, cell-specific uh, chromatin accessibility. Um, so thank you for, for the invitation. Um, um, so we've we've known from the, the, the past 15 or so years of large-scale GWAS that a lot of genetic risk variants are non-coding. And so um, people have um, invested um, a lot of time and effort into understanding uh, the, the genetic regulatory effects of these variants, mostly in relation to expression QTLs um, and, and splicing, like Mike just talked about. Um, but we've taken a, a complementary approach looking at other molecular traits that can inform on the molecular uh, mechanisms of disease. And so we're extending these, these ideas from expression QTLs to, look at, to looking at quantitative variation in chromatin accessibility, which is involved in the, the, the regulatory landscape of the gene expression. And beyond this, we know that uh, disease biology is cell type specific, and that the chromatin accessibility landscape is 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 cell type specific. So we've generated data uh, 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 using a taxic from four different brain uh, regions and two different cohorts, and then sorted uh, into two different cell types: neurons and non-neurons, which will will. Uh, 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 which are uh, glia and are a mixture of oligodendrocytes and astrocytes and, uh, and other cell types. And so th this gives us a window into the, the cell type specific genetic regulation. Um, first, we see that the chromatin accessibility QTL, um, the, the signals show a very strong um, a, a similarity based on cell type. So these are the the different cohorts and the different brain regions. And this color, uh, the 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 red is neuron, and the the blue is glia. And the results really cluster by cell type, um, which is is consistent uh, with the the, the the cell type specific biology. And so, because of this strong cell type specific effect, we, we used a meta analysis uh, 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 based on our previous work to combine signals by, by cell type. And so, um, overall, we, we found about 35,000 open chromatin regions under a genetic regulation by chromatin accessibility QTLs divided into a couple different categories. So first we're gonna talk about cell type specific peaks. So these are open chromatin regions, which are only open in one cell type. Um, so for example, in neurons, we find about 11,000 open chromatin regions, which are specific to, to, to neurons, uh, which have detectable uh, chromatin accessibility QTLs, and slightly fewer at almost 9,000 uh, for, for, for glia. Of the regions that are shared, the, where, where, where the OCRs are shared, um, we used a multivariate uh, Bayesian meta-analysis with Masher in order to identify cell type specific versus shared uh, genetic effects. And we find, of these, we find only about 3,600 which 
with uh, shared genetic effects uh, uh, across these two cell types. And so overall, only about 10% of Oceo of, of, uh, of chromatin accessibility QTLs are shared across uh, uh, cell types, which uh, strongly supports the, the, the cell type specificity. Um, which gives us, which will give us some insight into the 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 the, the cell type specific disease mechanism. Um, in addition to the detection uh, being cell type specific, the biology of the findings is also a very cell type specific. So when we look at the 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 lead uh, CACUTL variants um, in their enriching enrichment for open chromatin regions detected in, in single nucleus attack seq we see that for example the 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 regulatory variants uh, from neurons they're strongly enriched around open chromatin regions from excitatory neurons and not as much in say in oligodendrocytes where conversely um, the glial the uh, regulatory variants, they're enriched in multiple non-neuronal uh, 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 cell types. So we so we see this uh, this very strong uh, cell type specificity in um, where the variants are. In addition, we see a uh, cell type specific transcription factor binding, uh, cell type specific disruption of transcription factor binding uh, uh, motifs. So first, as we uh, do statistical fine mapping and divide the fine mapped variants post, uh, based on their posterior probability, as we get stricter in the posterior probability, we show, we show larger enrichments for the, for uh, perfecting a, a TF binding for both cell types. And then when, when we when we get uh, more detailed to specific transcription factors, we see enrichments um, in neurons for neuron-specific tr uh, transcription factors, and the the specificity is that that shown by this color. Where in glia, the enrichments are for more glia-specific transcription factors. Um, so far, the analysis has been. Um, on the uh, 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 using a standard regression type model, where you take your chromatin accessibility um, and regress that on the genotype uh, one step at a time. But there's a complementary signal in the data that we can take advantage of, which is allele-specific chromatin accessibility. So within an open chromatin region, you can look at a particular SNP and count up the the allelic imbalance, and the the null expectation is fifty percent of the variance will be from each read. But um, if that SNP, uh, if the the there's um, allele specific <laughs> expression, a, a, a chromatin accessibility, that's that's indicative of genetic regulation. So when we uh, combine these signals across all sites and all donors, um, we get thousands of sites um, uh, w with significant allele specific effects. And these are also very cell type specific. So in neurons, they're, they're very specific for open chromatin regions um, for excitatory neurons. And then conversely, the glia is enriched around um, uh, for uh, around regions for oligodendrocytes. Um, and then we observe that the allelic ratio is also very correlated with the chromatin, the the, the regression coefficient from the, the, the chromatin accessibility uh, regression model, where under the null model, they're independent, but when we detect genetic regulation, they're, they're going to be uh, uh, significantly correlated. So we see that this signal is cell type specific, but most importantly, for for our purposes, it, it, it improves the 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 resolution of statistical fine mapping. 
So an example is shown here, where this is the chromatin accessibility uh, QTL just based on regression. And you can see because of LD, these red points are in the 95% uh, uh, credible set. When you look at chromatin, the, the allele specific signal, it also includes a, um, a, a, a fairly large set of variants. But when we merge these two signals in a, a statistically rigorous way, then it nominates this single variant uh, with, uh, with very high posterior probability. Um, and that is predicted to disrupt this, this ERG3 uh, 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 site. That specific example um, is just to, to give an example for this larger trend. So in neurons, the, the median size of the credible set decreases from uh, about 16 to nine SNPs and in glia from about 12 to nine SNPs. Um, and by another metric, the number of, of open chromatin regions with a single uh, credible variant um, just about doubles in neurons um, and it, it, it increases substantially in glia. So this can help in identifying the molecular mechanisms of, of um, of this, the chromatin accessibility and, and downstream uh, and downstream phenotypes. So there's also, we've identified uh, substantial shared regulation between multiple, multiple molecular features, where when we perform co-localization, here is the chromatin accessibility QTL and co-localizes really well uh, with expression QTL uh, uh, for this gene, and there's the relevant open chromatin region that's affected. When we look at the co-localizations, it's over uh, a 1,500 examples been looking at gene expression from brain homogenate with smaller sample size looking at um, a single nucleus RNA-seq. We see um, we see uh, substantial enrichments as well, which are very cell type specific. So the neurons are um, enriched for co-localization within excitatory neurons and the glia for, for oligodendrocytes. We also, these co-localizations between a gene and uh, an open chromatin regions are, are enriched for enhancer promoter links where the enhancer folds over and meets a promoter at the transcription start site of a gene. And so these uh, share, can, can share genetic regulation and we, we observe enrichment for that in both cell types. Um, and finally, there, 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 there's, still, there's cell type specific uh, uh, sharing of the, the fine mapped variants as well. Um, the, the integration of GWAS of of the, the the these these chromatin accessibility uh, uh, QTLs with GWAS of uh, uh, finds further cell type specificity. The statistically fine mapped variants are enriched of for disease. So this is enrichment from LD score regression using the fine mapped variants. So the strongest signal by far is fine mapped variants. Um, in glia are very cell type specifically enriched in Alzheimer's. Um, and it's the same for, for Parkinson's, where other diseases show shared regular, show, uh, show enrichments, but RNS cell type specific, like, uh, like major depression and schizophrenia and education years and, and, and neuroticism. Um, when we look at the co-localizations, the by far the, the the largest count is just between eQTLs and GWAS, and that that's, that's just shown for uh, for context, which is followed by uh, triplets, including chromatin accessibility QTLs and expression QTLs and GWAS, um, and those are um, the most interpretable because they include a gene. 
in the triplet. We also ha have pairs, including GWAS and chrome gen accessibility, which don't co-localize with the gene. So an example of these triplets is the top is the, the, the expression QTL, the red points show the, the fine mapped variants, the 95% credible set. And here's the chromatin accessibility QTL. Um, and then this is the signal from major depression. When we, provide, when we perform a joint fine mapping on these three traits, uh, we get this is our top variant. Um, but there, there, there are some other variants in that set, and it's, uh, and it, it corresponds to, to this open chromatin region of, of right at the, the TSS of this gene rab 27 b When we look at a set of the, the co-localized triples, we see examples, say, in Alzheimer's of CLU, in neurons where there's a shared um, a shared open chromatin region across the two cell types, we, we detect an enhancer uh, promoter link and the, they're very close to each other, the, the gene and the OCRs. So it doesn't skip any uh, genes. Conversely, um, we see an example like, uh, like an, an MDD that, this AMT gene, there are eight genes between the open chromatin region and the co-localized gene. And so it's not simply the nearest open chromatin region or the nearest gene to your GWAS peak. This allows you to identify one, in, in, in some cases, one of a larger set of genes, say in this case of uh, when three skipping 11 genes between the open chromatin region and gene pair. Um, we followed up um, the, the QTL uh, uh, detection with high, high throughput functional validation of regulatory variants where we designed an NPRA using expression QTL fine mapping, where we tested about 20,000 variants uh, for allelic effects and identified uh, uh, 467 uh, with, with significant allelic effects. And the SNP class uh, was strongly associated with the magnitude of the allelic fold range. So for example, candidate causal SNPs showed a larger uh, fold change uh, study-wide than SNPs that were, say, a thousand base pairs from the candidate SNP. Um, and finally, the, the SNP annotation was also a good predictor of the, the, the magnitude of allelic effects. So the, the fine mapping posterior probability from expression QTLs um, was a very good predictor, explaining about 20% of the variation in the allelic fold change, um, and also the chromatin accessibility fine mapping uh, would, uh, was also a good predictor. Finally, um, when we look at this variant that we highlighted before, this was identified as showing a significant allelic uh, effect in the MPRA, and this variant has a shared effect, and importantly, in the same direction for the, the GWAS. So, so the, the risk variant um, increases the disease risk and increases, ex increases expression and chromatin accessibility and expression in the priori. Um, so just to wrap up, this was this is the largest atlas of genetic regulation of, of uh, cell type specific chromatin accessibility in the brain, we found that integrating allele-specific signals substantially improves fine mapping um, and co-localization between multiple molecular assays can nominate known and novel genes in addition to, to specific OCRs and, and, and specific cell types in disease risk. And we performed experimental validation and nominated um, this, this gene, RIB27B, in the biology of of major depression, and this gene, importantly, is 
is known to regulate a synaptic vesicle release in neurons. So with that, I would like to thank all of my co-authors, um, including uh, Panos Roussos and collaborators. And thank you. Great, thank you so much, Gabriel. Uh, so we're gonna now go to our third and last speaker for today, uh, Dr. Georgios Voludagis uh, from Mount Sinai. He's gonna discuss a new method called PolyScan that allows um, integrative analysis of different omics to be able to propose a single genetically driven uh, gene dysregulation score. Uh, Georgios, please uh, take it away. And thank you so much for joining. Uh, my pleasure. I'm just trying to... Okay. Can everyone we, see my screen? Uh, yes. How does it work? Okay. Great. We can hear you and see the screen. Thank you. Awesome. So uh, I'm actually in the bad position of being the last one. So I'm going to try to get your to keep your attention. But hopefully there has been a wonderful introduction about what are the problems that the field is facing. So I'm going to, you know, um, be able to cut some corners there. So what is the motivation of this tool? Um, as everyone has been saying, there's an increase in uh, availability of data sets that can be used to integrate uh, genetic and genomic information. Uh, however, we don't have really a lot of available tools uh, to combine data sets that are like from different assays, for example, transcriptomes, proteomes, ep epigenomes, and especially we don't have a method to do that when we don't have an overlap of the samples. So if, let's say, part of a cohort uh, was assayed with one way and part of the cohort was assayed with an, an other assay, we cannot like really combine them in a, in a very easy way to get like um, an integrated picture about what's going on. So PolyScan is a data-driven correlation aware meta-analytic framework for genetically driven genomic feature dysregulation. So the, the main innovations are the ability to integrate multi-scale genomic data sets, so transgenomic proteomes, uh, chromatin accessibility, and any other genomic feature, and the ability to integrate multiple levels of uh, cellular resolution, for example, homogenate or fax-sorted cells or single nucleus pseudobulk. Uh, now, like the, the high level picture is the following. We start with a GWAS and then we use our models and we take genetically regulated gene expression or genetically regulated epigenomes or we take genetically regulated proteomes. And then we use this method to derive a single gene score for genetically driven dysregulation. So, uh, I'm going to be using as an example the first model that we built, which is the model for the dorsolabial prefrontal cortex. Here are the data sets that were utilized. So uh, we used um, an imputation model for genes, isoforms, and then we used three imputation models for chip seq histone modifications, one for homogenate H3K27AC, and then neuron specific H3K27AC and H3K4ME3. In addition, we used an ataxic um, a homogenate um, model. So all these have one thing in common, the fact that they're all positively associated with transcription activity. So um, ataxic is the openness of chromatin regions, H3K27AC is a market of active enhancers, and H3K4ME3 is an active promoter mark uh, in a simplistic way. And then we show here that by building these different uh, imputation models, we are able to capture genetically regulated gene expression. And now we're going to take a, a, a break to kind of like discuss why it's important to integrate epigenome information as well. And, and here I'm going to be showing you um, an example of like the data sets that we discussed above, but using as a GWAS, uh, the schizophrenia GWAS, uh, that is a meta-analysis of the latest PGC, PGC3, and MVP samples. So as we can see here, um, we have a regional plot uh, where here is the GWAS, and we can see the DRD2 gene is here, and this is its transcription start site. So the annotations from RMC are here in the, in the top, and you can see the tracks here. 
So where the promoter lies, we see that we have a very strong, based on the Z-score, a very strong activation uh, in the promoter region uh, for the neuronal specific H3K4 ME3. And we also have activations in the uh, homogenate H3K27AC tracks in, in the enhancer region. And this, which seems to be close to the enhancer region, but hasn't been assigned uh, that specific mark. So this is really important because with no TWAS method that we know for DLPFC can DRD2 detect it. So here we have uh, this epigenome imputation saying that we have transcriptional, predicted transcriptional upregulation in DRD2, in dopamine receptor uh, D2, which is actually uh, the target that most antipsychotic medications that work for schizophrenia and bipolar uh, are antagonists for. Um, so then um, after, after kind of like showing uh, uh, the, the basic premises, I'm gonna talk about what is the Pollux can approach? What does it do? So it takes three inputs. The first input is the pairing of the gene and epigenetic feature groups. So uh, for a gene, let's say, oh, for, a, for a gene such as uh, a zinc finger A23, we first identify uh, based on proximity and the ABC method, uh, which are the features that are associated. So here it's like the gene, one transcript, and the H3K4ME3. The second input is the imputed features for the traits. So we take the GWAS of interest and then we use the models and we impute the genetically regulated changes in those features. And finally, we need a feature correlation matrix. And I'm going to show you why we need it. But basically, in this case, if we go to 1,000 genomes and we individually impute uh, all these features and we build the basic correlation matrix, we see that these genes and this gene, the transcript, and the H3K4M3 are very highly correlated at baseline. So this method, uh, while we were developing, we faced several challenges and we had to make uh, good decisions about like what is the goal of this method. So the first challenge was like how to do the, you know, the, the, gene, uh, the gene and feature pairing. So uh, as I showed you before for DRD2, um, there are several marks that can be found in the region of, in the TSS region of DRD2 and a little bit up, uh, upstream. However, after we use the proximity and ABC method, only the H3K4 ME3 survives. Now, this is because, again, we cannot detect the expression, so ABC cannot really link this enhanced region with a transcription start site. So we may be losing a little bit of power, but at the same time, we increase the confidence in our approach. So we're not gonna be including a lot of like uh, epigenetic peaks that may not be contributing to the signal since we're making the assumption that all these epigenetic features are really linked with the function of the gene. And uh, the, the, the second challenge is how do we control for power inflation? Since we have overlapping samples, the, epigenetic, the, the, the genetically regulated expression is based on the same GWAS, so we have to adjust for correlation. So as we can see here in, in uh, the zinc finger A23, we have three uh, different features. We said we have the genes, the isoforms, and we have the H3K4 ME3. And all of them seem to have about the same Z-score. And as we can see here in this forest plot, uh, when we meta-analyze with our method uh, using a fixed effect model and uh, that is basically repurposing the Lynn Sullivan method, we get, you know, based on the correlation structure that we have here, we don't increase, we don't cause inflation because we understand that these data sets are very highly correlated, these, these, uh, impute, these uh, genomic features. So we're just making sure we don't inflate the power. And we can see how this works in, in the QQ plots for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. When we see here, basically with orange is the TWAS and with blue is the polyxcan, we see that for the most of uh, the range, polyxcan actually has lower uh, observed p-values. And this can even better be seen in the bipolar disorder um, example. And actually the inflation values, the lambda, 
is lower in the polyx scan and epic scan when considering the shared genes. So genes that are identified by both, by both methods. However, since now we get like so many different lines of evidence, so we're basically incorporating six different data sets instead of one, we do get a better coverage of the genome. We get more information for more genes. So even though overall, as we can see in this Venn diagram, the number of FDR significant hits are not that, sm that much higher for polyxcan, we do get a different, uh, we do get different hits uh, when we are just, when compared just with TWAS. So 595 genes are FDR significant with both methods. However, we get a thousand uh, specific ones with polyxcan and about 800 with epixcan. Now, what, if we go and ask the question, what is different in, in these genes? One of the most interesting things that we found is that there is an enrichment for genes that are associated with neurobehavioral and uh, neurobehavioral and central nervous system phenotypes when we look at the OMIM database. So you can see here that the unique polyxcan FDR significance uh, genes and all the polyxcan FDR significant genes have a very strong enrichment that is statistically significant after FDR correction uh, that we don't see with the TWAS. So we're now going into and looking specific targets, but um, you know, this is super encouraging and actually we have already a lot of like targets that seem very good. So the whole motivation of this method was to actually not maximize the number of significant hits. We already uh, we're in a, in a state where we have a, an abundance of uh, genomic data sets and we have strong GWASs in many, um, in many traits. So we just want to increase the confidence and we want to in increase the biological relevance so that we can use these methods for gene target prioritization and precision therapeutics. Um, so I think this is a good way of uh, striking a good balance between power and uh, confidence. So uh, we're almost at the top of the hour, so uh, I would like to thank uh, my collaborators from uh, the Center for Disease Neurogenomics, uh, especially Panos and, and Gabriel, for, uh, who are also <laughs> here, uh, our MVP collaborators, uh, and also uh, collaborators from uh, uh, the Agbarian Lab at Sinai, and of course, uh, Psych and Cold. Uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I would like to thank all the speakers. So we are now done with all the presentations. Uh, we have a few more minutes in case that there's some questions. I know there was some questions on the chat that we can actually go through, uh, but if you have additional questions, please post it on the chat or uh, you can raise your hand and uh, just speak and um, um, ask the, the specific question. Uh, while we do that, hopefully this kind of call today. Uh, it was like um, kind of a mini demonstration for the additional data coming down for coming out from the second code pipeline. We also hoping that this kind of new data sets and new tools that we're developing, it's going to be of great use in a similar way that it was the earlier phase second code data. Um, all right. Um, I see on the chat, I don't know, Mike, did you I guess you reply in both questions, right? That was from Mary Kaka. Okay, perfect. So since we're waiting for, for a question, maybe I can ask a question here. Um, this is primarily for Mike and Gabriel. Um, I'm just wondering, given that um, this is all very big data and there's going to be like lots of different uh, outputs from different papers coming out from the second code, um, maybe can you describe if there's like a specific mechanism for making those data publicly easy for people that they would like to utilize? And if it's a visualization kind of portal that people that can use, to, you know, to look like the favorite gene or the favorite uh, transcript uh, or, you know, whatever they have interest. Um, so just wonder if you, if you can share some information about easy access to those data. 
Sure. Um, yeah, I think data sharing and visualization are obviously really critical outputs from all of the work that's gone into generating these data. So um, we use the Synapse portal for sharing of um, all, all the raw data, and then we'll have summary statistics for all of our fetal brain QTL uh, data sets on there as well. Um, we are also working on developing an interactive visualization platform and por portal. Um, this one is called Psych Screen. That's being led by Ji Peng Wang uh, at, um, and I think that that will provide a really nice uh, hub for integrating a lot of different data modalities. Um, and then, actually, I think I saw in the chat that maybe my response to the last question wasn't uh, didn't go out to the group, uh, which I apologize. So the um, Mary, I believe, had asked about the ancestry and population calling for our uh, fetal brain data, e EQTL data set. And so um, we have SNP genotypes from, from SNP arrays that were all imputed into the top med imputation reference panel, which I think does the best job currently for cross ancestry or uh, the diverse data sets, um, given that we have a multi-ethnic uh, uh, population. Um, and we also, we've made a summary statistics available for the specific ancestries, um, as well as a, a mega analysis uh, combined across the ancestries. And so that's how we deal with the, the population um, stratification issue. And I, I can speak to the, the data sharing too. All of our, our the results are on Synapse and the link is in the bioarchive. Great, so um, I think we actually on the top of the hour, I don't see any other question here. Um, so I would like again, I think we're gonna conclude this meeting. Um, I would like again to thank uh, my Gabriel and Georgios for joining today and presenting their work. Uh, I would like to thank PGC for the invitation. And then I would like to thank everyone who joined today's call for your attention and the, the interaction over here. Um, so I guess we're done. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Yeah. Thank you.